Last week I didn't get to finish my uh, sermon that I had prepared. I only made it through uh, the first three verses, so I had uh, verse 4 and 5 left. So we're going to pick up today uh, where we left off last week. So if you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. F.B. Meyer wrote about two Germans who wanted to climb the Matterhorn. They hired three guides and began their ascent at the steepest and most slippery, slipperiest part of the mountain. The, me- the men roped themselves together in this order. Guide, traveler, guide, traveler. They had gone only a little way up the side of the mountain when the last man lost his footing. He was held up temporarily by the other four because they each had a toehold in the niches that they had cut out in the ice. But then the next man slipped, and then the next man, and he pulled down the other two above him. The only one to stand firm was the first guide, who had driven his spike deep into the ice. Because he held his ground, all the men beneath him regained their footing and survived. F.B. Meyer concluded his story by drawing a spiritual application. He said, I am like one of those men who slipped. But thank the Lord God Almighty, I am bound in a living partnership to Christ. And because he stands, I will never perish. The title of today's message is Preserved by the Power of God, Part 2, and uh, we're going to look in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start and read in verse 1 uh, through verse 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithany, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today and I thank you for who you are and what you've done. Father, I thank you for this church and for what it stands on. Father, I thank you for everyone that came out today. I pray that as uh, your word goes out, Father, I pray that all of us will be open, uh, open our hearts and minds to, to whatever you have to say to each of us. Father, I pray that you would Hide me behind your cross, fill me with your spirit, and give us a good service today, and let everything honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, if you weren't here last week, no big deal. I'm going to catch you up real quick here. Um, so, we, we made it through verse 1, 2, and 3, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-give you some of the background leading into this, and give you a little bit um, on the first three verses there, then we're going to jump, jump back into verse 4. So, leading up to uh, this letter, which... Peter wrote, um, Nero had set Rome on fire. The Romans were hopeless and homeless. And the Romans were blaming Nero, the emperor. So the emperor decided he needed to blame the Christians so he wouldn't take so much heat. Nero spread the word quickly that um, the Christians had set the fires. And as a result, vicious persecution against the Christians spread throughout the entire Roman Empire. Places such as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia, and Bithany, which is the names listed there in verse 1, the cities. This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire, but it rather increased Christianity instead of decreased, like we talked about last week. Peter calls, in verse 1, Peter calls... uh, the Christians in these places pilgrims because they were strangers dispossessed in a land not their own. 
They were foreigners. And as a result of facing persecution and being foreigners to this land because their final home being heaven, Peter wanted to give assurance to those Christians that no matter how bad it was, they had a living hope in Jesus. They had their salvation was living in Jesus. So that was what we focused on mainly last week was, was the phrase there, uh, born again into a living hope there in verse 3. So we also went over like what the living hope was and, and explained in different, different aspects of it. And I'm going to run down through that list again. This is everything the living hope is, eternal salvation, um, the, the same, same thing there. Living hope comes from God. We saw that in uh, Psalms 43, 5. Living hope is a gift of grace. We saw that in 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Living hope is defined by Scripture in Romans 15, uh, verse 4. Living hope is a reasonable reality. We saw that in 1 Peter 3.15. Living hope is, a secure, is secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We saw that in John 11. Living hope is confirmed in the believer's life by the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Romans 15.13. Living hope defends Christians against Satan, Satan's attacks. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 5. Living hope is confirmed through trials. We saw that in Romans 5. Living hope, our salvation, produces joy. We saw that in Psalms 146, 5. And then living hope is fulfilled in Christ's return in Titus 2, 13. This hope explained is... It's not a desperate hope. It's not a holding on to a faded dream hope. It's a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's founded on the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And in that, He is living. So in return, in our salvation, we are living. So that was a quick synopsis of, of last week. So now we're going to jump right into verse 4 here. And with all of this, Peter gives the Christians assurance of this living hope. And we further expands on it in the next verse. So let's, let's look at verse 4 again. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This would have been, a, been great news to the Christians. However, facing persecution, I am sure a lot of them were questioning whether or not this living hope that Peter just promised to them, if their, their salvation could be lost or taken away. And it is a very real question today, and a lot of people struggle with that, the fact of whether they can lose their salvation or, or if they can do something to make them lose their salvation. Peter wants to assure these Christians, and he wants to assure you that it is not going anywhere. It is secure. So he begins by... Um, the, the first three words there, to an inheritance. Everyone knows what an inheritance is. And that's what he draws, uh, that's what he draws um, our, our, our living hope, the, something that is waiting for us like an inheritance. And an inheritance was used back in the Old Testament. It was, it was used multiple times uh, with Abraham. And we're going to go back and look at some of those. So let's uh, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Inheritance is used as, as, a, as a metaphor all throughout um, the Bible. And we're going to look at a couple places where that is in the Old and the New Testament. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. This is uh, God promising Abraham an inheritance. To then, the Lord, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God was promising the land of Canaan to Abraham. Even though that would be many, many years down the road before the Israelites ended up there, he was promising Abraham this was what was going to come. And we're going to see that throughout uh, the rest of these uh, verses. So turn to Genesis 50. Genesis 50. Verse 24. Genesis 50, verse 24. And this is Joseph. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land 
to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then turn over to Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34, verse 4. So this is, this is the continuing theme that he promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. And we know in Egypt, Joseph um, was there. And then the, the Israelites come out, of, come out of Egypt. Moses is leading them. And then look at verse 34, verse 4 in Deuteronomy. And the Lord said to him, that to him is to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give to it to your descendants, I have caused you to see it, but your eyes, but you may not cross over. So he, then, then he proceeds to tell Moses that this land was an inheritance. Then flip over one page to Joshua 1. This is the last one in the Old Testament. The inheritance is a, is a key theme throughout the first books there uh, the, in the promise to the Israelites. Uh, Joshua 1, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. So this theme, this theme is there, and then it picks up again in the, in the New Testament. Uh, and flipping to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. So this was something that um, they would have understood very, very clearly, as, as the people in these, in these cities would have been a mix between Jews and Gentiles. So they were very familiar with, with the, the land that God promised the Israelites. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before Jesus and asked Jesus, Good teacher, what, sh- what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Two more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 9, this is continuing the theme of an inheritance that is all the way through the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of, lo- of God. So it's used in both ways. It's used for people that are saved, that, that will inherit um, will inherit eternal life. And it's used also in a negative form where people that aren't saved will not inherit. Last one, Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. The point is that while the Christians may suffer in this age and have no future here, there is waiting for them a faithful reward as sure and as real as that of Abraham, the promise to Abraham. And it's going to be far better than any earthly land that God promised to the Israelites. It'll be heaven, and it'll be far more lasting. It'll be forever. To describe this inheritance, Peter uses three adjectives, and the first one is incorruptible, which means that like everything that you see, everything that you know, is going to die, be destroyed, um, decay. I mean, everything you know will not exist after this, after the tribulation. Nothing will rot or, or decay. Everything is permanent. It's incorruptible. You are corruptible. 
Your bodies are corruptible. Your bodies will die and decay. I, mine will, and so will yours, if, if Christ doesn't come back first. This church building will not be here at some point. The cars in the parking lot will cease to exist. There's nothing in this world that's going to leave this world except one thing, and you can't see that. That's your soul. That is the only thing that is not incorruptible. And Peter uses that incorruptible to, to point to the fact that everything we know is corruptible, but the one thing that isn't corruptible is going to be there in the last times, it, it, our salvation. And so he wanted to tell the Christians that no matter what, what happens, no matter what you go through, your salvation is not going to go away. It's not going to die. It's not going to fade. However, God promises eternal life, our living hope, our salvation will never be broken nor cease to exist. It is incorruptible. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to look at uh, another thing that we can see that is incorruptible here. 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, now that they do it, to obtain a perishable crown, but for we an imperishable crown. I was talking about the, the race of life. And flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. You're going to see something else that is imperishable or incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now the people that are being raised are the saved Christians. Your soul will meet Jesus in the air because it is incorruptible. So the second uh, adjective that Peter uses there is undefiled. Undefiled, this word in the Greek means unpolluted, unstained with evil. Sin has not touched our salvation. Sin has not tarnished our salvation. An undefiled inheritance of the Christian is marked in contrast to our earthly inheritance, all of which is corrupt and defiled. Everything here is corrupted. I was trying to think of something that wasn't corrupted. And I'll be honest with you, I could not really think of any, anything. The only thing that I could really think of is, is in when, it, when it snows. And before anything is cut, before the snow is touched, you look out and it's a white sheet. That is the only thing I could think of that, that is not corrupted. And even, even that is. But that's a good picture of, of looking out and seeing the white snow untouched. The third thing that Peter says about our salvation is it's unfading. It's a term that is unique to Peter. Nowhere else in the Bible can you find the Greek word that's used here for unfading, and he uses it one other time. Flip over a couple pages in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Our salvation is not going to fade away. Indicating that unlike flowers that wither and have to be tossed away, this inheritance, our salvation, does not wither. It does not fade away. So I ask you this question. I was trying to think of something that, that is always fading. So it, think in your head, what is one thing that is always changing? One thing that is always um, you go from one thing to the next thing very quickly. And and this is this is what I came up with. Right here. Technology. Technology is always changing. Right when you get a new iPhone, then the next iPhone comes out. And you can never keep up with the next version, and you always have to check up check for updates. So I want you to know that we don't have to check for updates. We don't have to check to see if our device is compatible because our salvation isn't fading. 
It's not changing like technology. We don't have to say a prayer and say, God, I hope I have the, the right version of my salvation because your version of the salvation is always the same and it's never going out of date. When we, we receive our living hope, when we receive our salvation, it is unfading. It doesn't expire. This inheritance is safe as well. If you look there in First Peter four or First Peter one, back to our verse here in verse four. So we saw our inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, and it does not fade away. Then, then the last uh, phrase there is reserved in heaven for you. This inheritance is safe as well as another thing that could be another word that could be used there instead of reserved is, is guarded. Guarded in heaven for you. And this is this is talking about back in verse three, our, our living hope, our salvation. Excuse me. Our inheritance is safe as well is safe as well as it is guarded in heaven. Like the treasure in Matthew six twenty. It is totally secure. And you flip over to Matthew six twenty. It's talking about the uh the treasures in heaven that are there and, and it says um, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal that is the same concept there in Matthew as it is in First Peter moth and rust is not going to destroy it no thieves are going to come in and catch God off guard because he was sleeping no one's going to steal it once it is yours, it is yours forever, and God is there, and He protects it for you. We are broken people ravished by sin. Nothing we can make, have, or touch can match up to this inheritance. This inheritance, your eternal life, your living hope, your salvation in Jesus Christ should give you hope in the darkest times. This is a promise, a guarantee, just like it was for Abraham and all the generations to follow him. Take joy in this fact. If you're saved, you're redeemed. If you're redeemed, you're sealed. And if you're sealed, you will live in glory of heaven with Christ forever. This is the promise that this passage gives. Peter gives the persecuted Christians the security of preservation through God's promises. Let's look at verse 5. 1 Peter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's a conscious balance between God's actions in heaven protecting our future and His action on earth protecting us in the present. If you look there, the first word in verse 5 is who are kept. First two words, who are kept. So he was talking about there, verse 4, verse four reserved in heaven for you. That's talking about our living hope, our salvation. And then he switches gears, who are kept by the power of God. That is us. That is us here now. The picture is, is this. Picture a military fortress or a camp or a fort of, of some form. We are inside the fortress. Outside the fortress is the evil forces. And they're assaulting the fort. But on the perimeter, guarding, guarding the walls, is the overwhelming force of the power of God. And nothing will be able to penetrate that. Supreme power, omniscience, omnipotence, and sovereignty not only will keep our inheritance secure, but it will also keep the believer safe. It is God that protects us. We have nothing, and we can do none of it by ourselves. If we try, we will fail. We don't have omnipotence, which is all power that God has. And by the way, not only is it protect, protected by God, but no one, no thing, no person, not the devil, 
can disqualify you from it or take you from it, take it from you. Romans 8, 38 and 39, um, Paul writes, this, this gives us a little background into that. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul right there says there's nothing created, and everything in this world is created, including the devil. Nothing can take you away from the love of God. The goal of this protection is, is the salvation prepared, uh, as it says there, you, prepared in the last time to re, to be revealed in the last time. Back in First Peter now, First Peter five, one five, it says, "For your salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time." The goal of this protection is not the is not the last time that we think of as as in. Um, the, the end times um, it is but it's not it's not the whole age it's, it's the last time it's, it's the specifically it is, is the verse that fo- focuses on the whole period not, not its closing stage but on the final scene of the age when Christ returns to judge the godless and resurrect and reward those who believe that's the time that's specifically talking about there and, and at that time we will be uh we we be pulled to glory. And going back to uh, to the protection, you know, God is protecting us now. I'm not saying that um, everything in your life is going to be perfect. There's going to be physical ailments. There's going to be financial problems. There's, there there could be marriage problems. There could be all kinds of different problems. He's not protecting us um, from from those things. That sin has caused us us to have those problems but it's like this God will protect us not like a guard watching over prisoners who will in the end be condemned when the judge gives his verdict but he's like a guiding soldier protecting people as they move through hostile territory toward the freedom of the friendly lines God is prote- he's, he's guiding us like a soldier guides people through the, the enemy lines to get to the friendly lines, which for us, that is a second coming. God energizes your faith and continues to preserve it. Saving faith is permanent and it never dies. Jesus saves us through his death and resurrection. God preserves us through his power and the Holy Spirit sustains us through his presence. God has promised us a living hope through his son that we all inherit if we accept Christ as our Savior. He then promises us that unlike everything that is on this earth that will pass away, our inheritance, our living hope, our salvation will not pass away. And finally, God promises us that we will guard, that He will guard and keep it secure until Christ's second coming. When He pulls all believers home, to glory for good. God guards our salvation. We cannot lose it. He is protecting our inheritance from corruption and loss. He preserves us. God, the, the title of this message was Preserved by the Power of God. It is through God's power that we are preserved in Him. So I ask you, what are you doing for Christ today? The devil and his minions are out trying to conceive or convince you that this inheritance, that your salvation is not real and there's no need to live for eternity because this is all life has to offer. And let me promise you that this is but a blimp in the timeline. Take heart, church. We have the living hope. I encourage you, if you're not saved, to make that right today. If you are saved and have sin in your life and you want to restore your relationship with God today, today is the day. Your inheritance and life are guarded by God both here and in heaven. It's time for you to start living like it. Time for me to start living like it also.
During the initial construction on the Golden Gate Bridge, no safety devices were used, and 23 men fell to their deaths. For the final part of the project, a large net was used as a safety precaution. At least 10 men fell into it and were saved from certain death. Even more interesting, though, is the fact that 25% more work was accomplished after the net was installed. And you ask why? Because the men had insurance of their safety and they were free to wholeheartedly serve the project. God promises full security to you and to me. And until you have complete confidence in the, insur- in the assurance that Christ gives you, you will not be able to serve with all your potential. So if you have doubts, if you uh, need, to, need to be walked through things, come find one of us. First Peter, or for Peter explains that, that it's incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it doesn't fade away. Once you have it, you always will have it. Father, I come before you today, and I thank you for, again, who you are. Father, I thank you for um, your power and how it preserves each one of us. Um, I pray that if anyone has doubts today or, or anyone um, is worried about their, their, their assurance of their salvation, Father, I pray that um, you, you would bring them uh, to the realization that, that they need you, Father. I pray as we continue um, in, through this service, I pray that everything we do in honor, will honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.